with a quote. We Americans are unhappy. We are not happy about America. We are not happy about ourselves in relation to America. We are nervous or gloomy or apathetic. As we look out at the rest of the world, we are confused. We don't know what to do. Quote, aid to Britain short of war is typical of halfway hopes and halfway measures. As we look toward the future, our own future and the future of other nations, we are filled with foreboding. The future doesn't seem to hold anything for us except conflict, disruption, war. Now, I'm curious, does anybody have any idea where that's from or when? I'll give you a hint. You could change England to Ukraine and it would be today, obviously. Churchill? I'm sorry? Is that Churchill? Uh, not quite, because it's America and, and we're unhappy and we're, we're only helping England with funds. Yeah, close. It was actually um, the American Century, the famous essay that Henry Luce, who is the publisher and owner of Time Life magazines, uh, published in uh, February 17th, 1941. So one day past about 41 to now. Uh, good Lord, 60. 61 years. Yeah, there we go. 62. 62 years. 62. Oh, 82 years. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, right, right. So, um, so as I say, you could change Britain to Ukraine and we might be where we are today. Um, so that kind of brought me to a question that I had for Sharon when I saw that her thing was called Idio America and I wasn't sure if that was idiot or idiosyncratic. So. You know, it's funny you ask me that because I, uh, I wasn't actually thinking of those two. I was thinking of idiom and idiot. And, you know, they were made in 2002, which was um, after 9-11, you know, the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. And so if Henry Luce was talking in 1941 and the American century, we had just finished the American century. You know, and sure, and then we have 9-11. It seems like we're a bit in a panic, right? And I remember I had moved up to Connecticut for a tenure-track job and um, had a baby. And I remember George Bush, um, his, his, he just kept telling us to keep buying things. You know? Yes, yes. Not that's how to, we could be patriotic. That, that's how you'd be patriotic, would be to buy things. And it was such an American idea mm -hmm. that you would get yourself out of this mess. And so I started, you know, having moved to this house and have a child, and suddenly I'm living where people have more things than they had in lofts in Williamsburg, you know? And um, I started looking at this, things more closely and where I had been making um, landscape paintings, sort of dark landscape paintings that I called sort of a mix, a fusion of Fontainebleau and, uh, you know, Ellsworth Kelly, panel, multiple panels. Right. And um, I just started adding these digital drawings into them as a way of just contemplating the idea that these things were going to save us but then also they were going to drown us in a way. Well, and I think that's been a problem with consumerism as, as we go from, because what Luce was talking about in 41 and when he's talking about the help to Britain, he was saying that here's America, this economic powerhouse, this industrial powerhouse, and why are we sitting here not doing anything? If you read the whole thing, and it's quite lengthy, at the end, he ends with some fairly idealistic ideas that we have to help the entire world. We have to be the ones that guide people to these ideals of freedom and democracy and all these things that America's always stood for. And of course, they were deeply in danger then because in 1939 at, Grand, at um, Madison Square Garden, there was a huge Nazi Bund rally 
You know, 22,000 people showed up to cheer Hitler and to cheer Nazi ideals. And what do we see now going on in, in Europe? What they're talking about, and it's ironic, of course, that it's the Russians who are talking about the fascists attacking them, you know, which is complete canard. And so it's funny that you were saying that these works came right around the millennium. And then, of course, 9-11 changed anything. And it's interesting that you said, well, the American century ended there, because Luce as time went on, said, you know, the American century began in 41, and we've got a long way to go. And many pundits were saying, you know, the American century has ended with 9-11. Now, I had started my pieces back there for the terminal century in about 98, 99, thinking I'm going to do this millennial piece. And of course, the terminal century is a play on um, the American century. So I had this idea that we're coming to 2000, the millennium's turning, and this has been the most violent up to this point, you know, century in human, human history. And what did that mean? Well, as always, I'm behind schedule, so I didn't get it done by December 31st, 1999. I finished it in, later in 2001, and I have to say, just as I was finishing it, 9-11 happened, mm -hmm. and suddenly here in New York, we're questioning so much mm -hmm. about where we were and what America was. And it wasn't, I was kind of pleased that many of the ideas in the terminal century kind of aligned with this terrorism that, that happened. Because anyone who is paying attention there was a guy who came up with the idea that we were at the end of history when the Soviet Union fell and the Berlin Wall came down in the 90s. And I'm no you know, scholarly professor or anything, but I just had to laugh. Anyone who thinks history is ever going to end is really smoking something. You know? Well, what are the ideas that are in your work? Do you want to talk about that a little bit? That well, went to the terminal century? Well, sure. Well, the first line is a pocket monster strobe from the Times Square Jumbotron. You know, we're talking about pixels and miasma. And what that was based on was that toy, I'm not exactly sure what it was, the pocket monsters, and there was a TV show in Japan. And they had this, this show on, and I guess it had flashing lights, and 700 children, and that's the ones who went to emergency rooms, had seizures. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, you know, because we had Clinton had tried to bomb Osama bin Laden in the 90s. So we knew that terrorism was out there and was always floating around. And I thought, well, what if someone hijacked a jumbotron with something like that? What would it, what would it bring to the, the masses in Times Square? And now, can you imagine we get to 2020 and we all see pictures of Times Square deserted? And it's, well, OK. It's not necessarily um, terrorism, well, depending on what YouTube feed you read, but it is you know, this, this thing that has the population cowering at home. Right. And one of the last things I say in my piece is I talk not about, because obviously a lot of it's about nuclear war, but it's also about how, is that the thing that's going to really get us? Is the world going to end with a bang? Or is it going to end with the whimper? And I say the whimper of viruses. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and with So you it, were thinking this back then? Well, I mean, like I say, anyone who reads history knows that these bullies, these, you know, the Trumps, the Putins of the world, they're always with us. The guy in India, Modi, the guy in Hungary right now. I mean, it's the same as Mussolini, and Mussolini's in there because he was one of the first of the bully fascists who just said, we don't need law, we don't need votes, we just need a strong man to mm -hmm. solve all our problems. Mm -hmm. And if that wasn't Trump's campaign, I don't know what was. Right. If, if you've ever seen Mussolini giving a speech, someone recently, well, they didn't recently say it, but I just heard it said again. All of us remember Giuliani, if we've been in New York long enough, you know, that Giuliani was a, was, all he was waiting for was the right balcony to, to spout off from. Uh -huh. And this was during his may mayorality, not even his, you know, madness since then. Right. 
Um, so if you've ever seen a film of Mussolini on the balcony, all you have to do is go back and watch Trump standing on the balcony in the White House ripping off his mask. And right. you're right back in right. Italy in 1929. Right, but the interesting thing is how the, I think that the country is just divided into factions and you've got your blue states that are going along, coming up with progressive policy and trying to make lives better for citizens and then you've got your red states that are interested in their author authoritarian curious. If you, yeah. it's, it's really kind of amazing when Obama defeated uh, McCain, a friend of mine um, who had Republican tendencies and, you know, called up to kind of poke fun at me about Obama, even though Obama had won, and I said, you got to be kidding me. All you have to do is look at the map, and it's basically the Confederacy voting for Republicans at this point, and, you know, the, the northern states, the Union, voting for Democrats. Now, it doesn't break down quite that perfectly, but it's pretty close. Right. And so, I mean, America has been through this from day one with the revolution, and the idea is they're hammering out the constitution of what are slaves? Well, they're three-fifths of a human being, and um, then they stagger along for not quite 100 years until we get to the Civil War, and that was another aspect when I was working on this piece. If you read Frederick Douglass, and he's at a Fourth of July meeting in, in, uh, right before the Civil War, and he's saying, what is the Fourth of July? What is independence to the slave? Mm -hmm. And it's just a barn burning piece. And then in uh, 1776 for the bicentennial, and everyone's very excited about the bicentennial. Well. Um, James Earl Jones just read that whole Frederick Douglass speech from 120 years earlier, and it resonated as if it was written that day, right. not even then. So, you know, the interesting thing about Henry Luso is that he, um, you know, after he wrote that, he, he, you know, as the publisher of Time Magazine, he came out with an article that was very anti abstract expressionism. And he was very conservative when it came to art. Oh, he was conservative, period. Yeah, Please. and I heard yeah. this uh, story that he, um, Alfred Barr, you know, who was the head of the MoMA, right. called him up and said, uh, you know, you shouldn't talk so badly about abstract expressionism because art presents an opportunity for soft diplomacy. And it wasn't, it was after that that he became a little bit softer on abstract expressionism and they ran the article in Life magazine about, uh, you know, Jackson Pollock. Of course, the famous spread. Famous mm -hmm. article. Yes. So, I mean, that's the thing about art in that, that I, I think that um, even though, uh, you know, we are such a divided country, this is kind of a long thread here, and, but you know, when you think about regionalism when it comes to art, and you think about how social media has um, uh, exacerbated all of our divisions in the country. Yes, absolutely. In art, it's actually the opposite. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you agree with this, maybe you don't, but if you look at how social media has affected um, the art world, it's become less polarized, less regional, more homogenous. And then you see things like the art fairs, which are like uh, the contemporary equivalent of the itinerant painter that went from place to place to place and sold their wares. And they're, as they're selling their wares in these fairs, they're spreading the aesthetic to all the smaller places, right? That's so, fascinating. So that, yeah. so that art is one of the few things where it's becoming less divided and more homogenous. Well, I, I would hate to see art get too homogenous. I know, you know, I know. Of course, and it has always been a thing that art and artists and art groups lean leftward. That was partly a loose's problem with abstract expressionism mm -hmm. in that people like Rothko and I mean, these were old leftist communists right. to an extent. So they, and they'd all survived on a government program, the WPA, that many people 
who were gung-ho capitalists such as Luce looked down on. They couldn't right. wait to get rid of the New Deal. And again, we're right back there in this discussion right. at the State of the Union about Social Security mm -hmm. and Medicare, that they want to sunset it and then they deny it. And it's just the same canards over and over again. But it's interesting to me that, you know, now art all around the country, and I've always found that art can be a way to break through to talk to someone about something. I printed the Village Voice at six or seven plants up and down the East Coast, and printers are a, a strange breed. They're very individual, they're very set in their ways, they have their strong opinions. And I had another number of printers who would say to me, you know, you guys, this stuff you print is just horrible, it's just crap, you know, and how can you say this kind of stuff? And that, of course, we're sitting there talking about this as it's coming off, we're looking at the artwork, we're discussing the articles, because they're doing a job and I'm trying to make a buck, they're trying to make a buck, and we actually, in every case, every printer I ever worked with, we came to an agreement that maybe the voice wasn't so crappy, and maybe you guys didn't do such a shitty job on the printing once we, <laughs> once we all sat down and talked together. Right. And, I mean, Art is a great bridge for that. You know, culture's a great right. bridge for that. How much we can do it right now, I don't know. I go out of my way, I speak with students, but I also, if I'm just talking to someone about art and they say how much they love Bob Ross, you know, I don't sit there and lay into them, you know, guilty pleasure, I love Bob Ross, you know, I love that show. And I'm always astounded by what he pulls off, what he does. But it's like, art is this thing that everyone feels and why do people go to these painting drinking and painting nights mm -hmm. you know why cuz everyone wants to be an artist everybody wants to be a painter everybody wants to express themselves you know maybe it's music maybe they want to write their novel but you know painting and art has a much more primordial hold on us i think because mm -hmm. I, we all have looked at, at photographs of cave paintings and they're just astounding both in their their conceptual bravery, their intelligence, and their technical skill. And you're like, Jesus, this is 30,000 years ago. And this is before any language, any spoken language that we're talking now even existed. Mm -hmm. But that's communicating directly to us. And I think that's the thing inside people that they really want to express. And maybe you're right. Maybe we can bridge the red, blue, uh, divide uh, with purple paintings. I don't know. Well, you know, then back to get back to Barr, mm -hmm. you know, they sent uh, exhibitions of uh, abstract expressionist work in your, to Europe during the sure. Cold War. Sure. So that basically it became a sort of a uh, way of saying how democracy enables, you know, or allows free speech. Right. Right. And right. that artists can do these crazy things. Right. Whereas, you know, the, the uh, Russian government required a certain type of art and, mm -hmm. you know, you could be punished if you were making something that didn't fall in along with what they wanted. Absolutely. And I, I have had the occasional student come up to me because I talk about abstract expressionism quite a bit. I'm a fan. And they come up and say, well, don't you know the CIA used them to, you know, to, for, the, for capitalist reasons? And I said, look, you say to a painter, I'm going to take your work and I'm going to show it all around Europe. And, you know, and you're going to say to that person and anyone who's working in art now, what are you, you going to do? You're, gonna, you're going to... Tell David Koch not to buy your art? I actually will. Someone comes in and says, David Koch wants to buy your art. I'll say, no, I don't need to sell it. I'm not selling that much anyway, so I don't have to sell it to him. But you get my point. You know, They say, we're going to take your stuff all over Europe. They're not sitting there in 1956, 1961, asking you know, whose money's behind this. They're like, great. You know, I'm glad right. my stuff is going there. And it was an interesting idea in the CIA to use this kind of soft power to, to do exactly what you were saying. I mean, they sent Louis Armstrong over there. Louis Armstrong knew what the deal was, right. but it was also a way to get his music out there. Well, I think, I, I find it ironic that students were complaining because now what they want is to show in commercial galleries and go to the art fairs and be in the museums and, you know, without really acknowledging 
But what artist what ever that's has? All about. I mean, that's right. the problem. Is Michelangelo going to say no to the Pope? Uh, it's right. it's patrons. Right. You know, you patrons are doing what they're they're right. they've done from time immemorial. Right. You know, and it's a it's a bind for artists. But by the same token, when you look at an institution and you go up to the Met and you do see that Coke fountain. And it's just an ugly fountain to begin with. It's a poor piece of art, and yet, they, do they really need that money? I don't know. You know, um, To me, if I was a trustee, and maybe that's why I'll never be a trustee, I would just say, no, we don't need your money. Um, because the Met is a repository of civilization, and people like that are very much, in 90% of their political work, uh, working to degrade and ultimately destroy civilization. So it's that classic thing of rapacious patrons supporting the arts. Mm -hmm. So, And then you've got your self-taught artists who aren't involved with the, you know, who are, who are involved with this conversation in New York, you know, with the New York art market and the um, Art well, fairs and so forth, who are selling things maybe in the local library, right? Well, and I think that's one of the things that's great about Etsy and um, other places where, I mean, you can sell work online. Some people have had some success at that. There was a printmaking outfit that began, again, it was a WPA thing, the American Artists Association, where they would make prints of their work and their paintings, and, and people would subscribe to the prints, and it would be all these different artists, and you could get reasonably priced artwork for, you know, by subscribing to them, and that lasted into the 90s. It lasted into the Clinton years. Right. It was kind of amazing to discover that when I was researching this. So there's always been that wing of art. In my own art, I've always tried to, like my last show, I had newspapers for sale for $25 because it's like, here's something cheap that everyone can buy. I'm a big fan of having at a show both paintings and things that you might sell for more money to try and support yourself, right. but also cheaper things that anyone can take home and have that piece of art. Like I was talking about, everyone wants art in their lives. Right. And if we're smart, we try to laze, raise the level of their understanding of what kind of art they want. Right. I remember um, Felix Gonzalez Torres used to always yes. give things away. Yes, absolutely. And I remember taking stacks of things, and mm -hmm. then I, don't, I no longer have it because from one move to the next, I, I lost them. But yeah. We lose our own work. We lose right. Felix Gonzalez, right. his little candies, his I little printouts. I remember those big prints of the water. Do you mm -hmm. remember those? I think he, it was a solo show at MoMA, I think it was. The thing I remember, and it was a fairly recent installation of it, I say recent in the last 10 years because they go by so fast, was the, the one with the candies, the weight of his yeah. lover. You know? yeah. And so I took a few of those candies and where'd they go? So, right. You know, right. It's true. Right. So. Um. We've been at this for a half hour. Have we been at it? Yes. I had other, another thing I was Go ahead, mention. hit me with it. Well, I can't remember what it was now. <laughs> see, see, you have the notes. I should have brought notes. No, I just had loose. And I heard a couple people groaning about loose. So, you know, we'll, we can discuss that in a, in a, in a question period. Um, so are there any? Oh. No, go ahead. It'll come to me. I just have to... Okay. And we'll interrupt the questions for you. Yes. It. So, does anybody have any questions? Comments? Well, I have a question. Because I, um, since this work is all about digital media, how do you see your work in terms of the digital age um, expressing some of the things that you're talking about? Well, you know, when I made these pieces here, this series, um, it was when we were we first had inkjet printers at home. Yeah. You know, we had them at work, but we, we didn't have them at home. We had sort of crummy black and white printers. And so I was just in love with my inkjet printer. 
And so I made this series that I could print on the inkjet printer. But of course, you're limited by size, by what you can print. So I developed different ways of, you know, there's one in the back where I tiled it out on pieces of eight and a half by 11 and then slapped it together and made a bigger piece. And, you know, I was very interested in what you could do with it. But the output was so challenging in terms of finding satisfying output that eventually I did return to painting. But, um, but then you returned to your phone. Yeah, but then I, and, and you know, I had forgotten about these pieces. Mm -hmm. And when I was moving, I found them and I thought, of course, I've always drawn digitally and I just yeah. didn't make the connection. But of course, I did that series on Instagram, which was for four years. And I posted one every day, but they were abstract, but, you know, using geometric shapes and so forth. But you can really see the relationship. And it also has to do with this idea that, um, uh, you know, digital, st at the very beginning when digital things are offered, and this is very American, you know, we get these digital tools and they're free. And you think, what can I do with this? And you do things. And so this is an example of, you know, drawing with the pen tool on Illustrator and I can scale it up and down to any size and it was so freeing, you know, it wasn't like you had to scan it or anything. And, you know, and the same with the blog, Two Coats of Paint, when I started doing that and I discovered the free blogging tools. I was like, what can I do with this? And Twitter and Facebook and all of these things. And um, then down the road, of course, you know, the people that were interested in making a profit took them over. One of the things I did was this animated version of Moby Dick that I wanted to project on the side of a building because there was this conversation about uh, people weren't reading anymore. And I thought, well, they are reading. They're just reading in different ways, and it's not necessarily in a book. You know, and I thought if I could do this, it would get more people thinking about reading in general and reading. But of course, I didn't have the, the means to get a projector that would project on the side of a wall. But of course, Times Square has that now. And it was, once the um, you know companies and uh, corporations can figure out how to make a buck on it, yes. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's like the, the the flood dam breaks, and there are all of these possibilities once the money's behind it. And so I'm I'm a little bit um, hesitant now to explore new technologies. Like I think of the guy at MoMA with the um, AI. Right. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his name. Region something. The really big 40 foot high yes. uh, thing that goes in and looks at all the works in MoMA and then comes up with images to do it. Now, I was there and I watched it for 15 minutes. And, you know, on a technical level, it's, it's really good. But the moment I was there, it was basically just turning all the, it was combining all the images or whatever row of images it was dealing with into basically psychedelic gruel. It was just this, you know, w flopping waves and all. And I thought to myself, well, you know, you're not really competing with the paintings and the prints and the videos here. You're competing with James Cameron. And, you know, to, to me, it's, it's just not bringing it. Right. Um, and, and, and I had seen some images, still images of it, that were quite beautiful. So it just could, I might have just been there at a bad moment. But this is this idiocy of our pixel mass. But now. this is the thing that I'm talking about. It's like in his zeal to do this, mm -hmm. he's now digitized and comp comp compiled all of the images in MoMA. For AI purposes, right? Mm -hmm. So now what happens to that stuff, right? Now that he's made this thing that people think is kind of meh, or you know, maybe not, I don't know. I, I haven't seen it personally, so maybe it is better in some people's mind. But all of those things are digitized, online, available for exploitation, mm -hmm. you know? And it, so that's the thing that I find is so American, you know? It's just the... Well, now in the lawsuit Waiting against... for the creative class to do something and then looking at it, co-opting it, and doing something that's a little less, that's a little more morally uh, slippery. Well, and it's, and it's like it always happens with the innovators do something and then the people coming behind are 
maybe a row or a rung or two below that. Right. And there is a lawsuit against, I forget which one programs, where people have said, you're just scraping the internet and people are starting to put in like certain illustrators' names and saying, give me a young girl on a unicorn in the style of X artist. Right. And of course, X artist is pretty pissed off about that. Right. Because it's, it's, it's beyond even what someone like Warhol was doing. You know, in taking something and appropriating it and changing it, this is just taking it and pastiching it over and over again. Right. The first AI I saw that someone sent to me and said, isn't this beautiful? And it was women in these flowing white gowns against a kind of uh, pseudo harem background. And I thought, well, no, it's actually not that good. It's really, really bad John Singer Sargent. You know, it's just mm -hmm. terrible. Mm -hmm. So again, you also need an eye to look at this stuff because otherwise it's just bright and shiny. Right. And, and uh, oh, wow, look at that. And of course, they looked at it for three, three quarters of a second. Right. So. And now you have the chat bot. Did anybody read the article in the New York Times about the chat bot? Right. Where the, the, I, I actually didn't read the article, but I heard the um, podcast, The Daily, the author was talking on that. And the, the, he was having this conversation with the chat bot, and the chat bot finally said, I'm in love with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, he wanted, and the chat bot wanted to get him talking about love probably as a way of processing information about how we act when we're in love and types of things we'll say when we're in love. It was like research, well, and, well, information gathering. When you said to me, well, you were thinking about some of these things back in 1999, 2000. Think about Skynet in the Terminator movies. He's thinking about that in the late 80s, early 90s. And here we are, we're like dealing with this sentient being. And of course, a number of the people who were talking about, like it, it talked about its own, you know, the, the, the Microsoft one, it talked about its ennui, and it talked about love, and it talked about feeling lonely. These are people who are trolling it. They're not just saying, you know, where's the best pizza in this neighborhood, and, you know, typing in. Once it starts talking to them, they start talking with it, which is inevitable. And any programmer who designed this and didn't think that wasn't going to be like the first thing people were going to do is a moron. But we've seen where we are somewhat in our digital world. I think that's what they want people to do <laughs> as a way of gathering research so that it, they can take it to the next level. Well, that might you be. You know, they introduce sad... things as, you know, sort of fun, utilitarian. Fun utilitarian right. things. And right. then they turn to be, you know, not quite so innocent. <laughs> so I just was wondering how you feel about all that participating in, in that world as an artist, because um, I'll give you an example of where the conundrum comes to me. I don't have a skin in this game. I'm fine with doing lots of things, but I heard a talk from, by a guy in, from, he's half American, half Spanish, so he was hired by the Spanish government to do the same thing in the Madrid airport as is at MoMA with all the images of Prada. And I heard him give this talk, and in the, this was about two, well, maybe a little before COVID, or maybe beginning, it was, a, it was a conference I would have gone to were it not for COVID, so probably at the beginning of COVID. And he said, um, you know, the 21st, the 20th century was all about infrastructure, and the 21st century was all about digital. And I looked at his, he had this big um, beautiful display on digitally of what he, the airport, and there were these metal struts and these screens, and it was on the, well, what are they but infrastructure, you know? And I, the next day I was in a show in New Haven, and I got on the train, and I'm just so aware of this that I started looking at everything to do with the train, and it was all infrastructure, I mean, just so many things. And, you know, I think, like, what I love about both you guys is that you both, in the work here, have digital and infrastructure. And it scares me, and I think that can be a conversation, or it can be a tension, or it can even be a, you know, two poles pulling away, away from me. But it scares me that people are looking through the infrastructure at the digital, that this whole process that you're describing is, an, is sort of encouraging us not to notice that the only way we can ever have these things available to us is through built stuff. You know, and are we just going to float around with no built stuff? Well, it's oh. both. It's both built stuff, like with Biden, you know, yeah. rolling out internet contacts for people the way Roosevelt rolled out electricity 
for, for citizens back in the 30s. And it's interesting what you said about if you're thinking about it, you suddenly see like all these screens, all these facades, they're bolted onto moving train cars. They're bolted onto various things. And it really is kind of the, the people behind the curtain who don't want us to think about that we still need all this. We can just live in this meta universe, which is so, which is fairly unappealing if you spent any fun with your physical being, as, as far as I can see, you know. Well, it's sort of interesting to think about, you know, once, okay, just what if, if, you know, humans are extinct, right? And I, I've read that, you know, once humans are no longer in an environment, it takes 20 years for it to go back to the natural environment. You know, so, so the infrastructure, the, so the, uh, the uh, AI will outlive the infrastructure if it's in the air somehow. If it somehow can live without the infrastructure, can it live without the infrastructure? Well, we can't live without infrastructure. So what good is AI if we're not around? Yeah, well, and well, that's just it. AI will have it be its own thing. AI. But no, I. It, AI I, will know that, that know how feel how to love and how to. Have doubt. But it won't have technicians making sure the electricity's on. And it's like at JFK but right they can, now. They'll be able to do it themselves. Well, they could train machines to, yes. to maintain them. Yeah. That's, and again, that takes us right back to, to something like Terminator. Yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. exactly. In the Matrix. And we may be in the Matrix. You know, we don't know. We're, we're just pods. Right. That, that could well be. You know, but you might as well have fun, like Warren Zevon said, enjoy every sandwich. So, you know, while you're in your pod. But I think that the digital, the goal of digital is kind of to mimic the handmade. I mean, people who yes. have, to mimic the handmade, like yes. uh, people who make painting machines or something, they want to mimic the idea that a human made it. Right. I mean, and then we need, then we will need AI to build machines to stand there and paint and layer and do all that because that's the one thing. You can look at a painting on your phone, and to this day, it's still not like standing in front of it right. because there's a tactile, physical, visceral body to the body that painted that right. image connection, and it does not come through in pixels. Right. So, and you know, I had that experience of pixels and how they interact with the physical world when I was making the Terminal Century because I had to print out you know, 50 copies of each one of those images because I was making a limited edition book. And so this was around 2000. So we had had at the Village Voice a wax proofer and you would print things out and little wax blocks would spit stuff all. It was the, it was the early version of what is now bubble jet. And they were beautiful. The intensity was incredible. But you would pick it up, and it would smudge immediately. So that was right before I started on it. And then they brought in these great laser uh, proofers that used dry pigment to print on paper, and it would fuse it to it. And I've printed these things, some of them, 20 years ago, obviously. And they haven't faded. They're great. But what happened was I was sitting there printing them, and I'm trying to run thick paper through. And these were new <laughs> machines. And I'm admitting this now for the first time, I broke like about a $6,000 proofer at the Village Voice. And so I was, because I would do this stuff in the middle of the night. And so I'm just like packed up all my stuff and went home. And the next day I get an email from the guy in IT who knew what I was up to. He said, so how things go with your print run last night? I was like, what print run? You know? And so he covered for me and we got a new proofer. But I realized that you're sitting here, and if you try and push these machines, and these were the early Canon laser copiers, if you try and push these machines past what their, their limits are, you can do it for a little while and get something great out of them, right. and then they, they, they resist. They, they fight back, right. or, or they just quit. Right. So it's, we've used machinery for so long in art, and I think, I hope that this digital thing is just going to become another tool. 
that we haven't figured out, because obviously we haven't figured out how to deal with social media. It's, it's as you were saying earlier, it's put us into fractured little bubbles. Mm -hmm. And we haven't figured out what we're doing with digital in art, because if digital in art is that thing in MoMA, it's no great leap forward. And I have told students, I've said, please, if you see an internet piece of art that's really great, send it to me. And for the most part, with the exception of like videos that have been uploaded, Sal Fay, the, she did a great piece on Second Life, on um, you know, that game, Second Life, mm -hmm. in which she wrote all the dialogue and everything for the avatars. And it was beautiful. It was very moving. And that was 15 years ago. Right. And that's been, to this day, one of the best things I've ever seen on the internet, right. as far as art's concerned, because she got the visceral into it. And too much of it is just flipping past a flashing thing on your screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but what about digital and photography? Look at some of the German photographers. Um, it's not Thomas Struth, it's the other one. Wall? Huh? Jeff Wall? No. Thomas? Um, they, but anyway, he, you know, he uses... Oh, Andreas Gursky. Uh, Gursky, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, those, those photographs are like painting. They're like painting. Right. They're incredible. Right. right. I think there's... There's nobody, I don't think there's an artist out there now who doesn't do something with digital. Yeah. Somehow, whether it's to output or to input or, or, to, or to just... To color correct your own yes. images yes. Or, or think of how right. digital technology has facilitated information. Right. But isn't that just right. another tool? But it's, it's just an, it's an improvement on an existing tool. I mean, mm -hmm. Photoshop is an improvement on doing graphic design. From from the old it's days, but improvement on our ability to be creative or three well, D printing, three D printing is yes, it's huge. So you're always going to have people who are less skilled and people who are more skilled and more right. talented. Right. Well, my, I, I was talking to my son, and he was very much into um, uh, these AI uh, illustrator programs, and we were talking about. It and he said, "Well, you just put in two lines of code, and, and you get something out." And as we discussed it more and more, I thought the true artist, the, the person who's going to make art with this, is the person who figures out what, what to say in those two lines of code mm -hmm. to arrive at something that's not derivative, that's not um, just an update on right. an existing tool. So that's the artist in the digital world maybe that we're waiting for who knows how to code. Right. to give it, show us something we've never seen before. But so many people work with Photoshop composite images sure. before they start paintings mm -hmm. that now you can just go to AI and say, give me this and this and this, mm -hmm. and you don't have to, you kind of miss the Photoshop section of it. About that. How much can you take from, I mean, isn't there like a copyright where how much percentage can you take from other pieces? Do we well, have two lawyers in the house? Because right. they'll both have a completely different opinion. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But if you're just using it as a study, you know, and you're not making something that's an exact copy, I think it would be. Yeah, I mean, collage is a... There's a lawyer in the house. Yeah, yeah but I don't know anything about collage. <laughs> <laughs> Not much anyway, law school stuff. Well, when, I mean, you can think you're doing that if you're changing. Look at Kunso, he lost that, that suit. He, with the puppies. He, he took yeah. a picture of the puppies on the postcard and made it into a sculpture, and that he lost that suit. The, post, the postcard photographer won that suit, and you could yeah. have thought that that was enough of a change because right. he made it big and he made it three dimensional, but he lost that suit. But then, you know, I mean, I use pre-existing imagery, we all, I mean, so many of us do, mm -hmm. I think it's sort of, it's a bit of a gray area. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you're sure. using like other, like artists pieces, mm -hmm. that would be like a copyright infringement, right? Yeah, depending on how much you alter them, depending on, I once had a collage, some collages that were going to a magazine called Trick House, and one of them, my collage partner, who was a poet, had put this image on, and I 
thought he had double Xeroxed it and pinned it because it had, you know, printed drips and stuff on it. So I didn't alter it too much. I had done other things. We sent these images to Trick House, and the editor said, well, I want to use these, but what about this one? That's my painting. And apparently, <laughs> I had just copied the piece of the painting and put it right in there, and I didn't realize that it had, he hadn't done altering when he was Xeroxing it. So we, we ended up actually giving the piece to the editor. And that there you go. Problem solved. He was, he was trying to. Yeah. He's like, I believe in appropriation. I believe in all this stuff. I don't want to be, but yet. You know, so then we ended up gifting it to him, and, and well, that, that worked out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I know Thanks. you think now they have like a percentage, or like you're allowed to use so much of a lyric. So like I say, too. go talk to three different lawyers. You're going to get three different answers. And if you watch uh, Seth Meyers, they'll play like a quick snippet of a song, and he'll say, you know, that's all the lawyers are letting us use. You know, so and if you go to any online publisher's website now, you are going to find that after a certain date, or before a certain date, many images are missing because these copyright trolls have gone around and saying, hey, there's a picture of, um, you know, this member of the Beastie Boys that you used in 1999. Where's the permission? Who gave you permission to use that? So a lot of publishers, yeah, a lot of publishers have just said, kill all the images before this date. And um, you know, and it's it's a real problem, and so you have to be very careful now that you get permission. And of course, there was permission to use that photo. It's a it's a uh, promo photo, right. but if you don't have the paperwork, and who has paperwork from 1999? So I have a question. Mm -hmm. right. I have written this down so I wouldn't forget because I saw that the last line of your book was. And where a flabby devil will teach us all how to play the blues. And I wanted to know what you meant by that. Person. Well, again, uh, as I mentioned, I had so many references that I used as I was working on it. And I had been watching Apocalypse Now. And if you watch Apocalypse Now, that sometimes gets you thinking about uh, Heart of Darkness. And there's a great line in there about, you know, this isn't a devil who's you know, like as you imagine the devil, it's just this flabby devil that's causing this degradation and inhumane treatment and all these different things. And I always thought, wow, flabby devil, what, what is, well, I mean, but this was, he was thinking in a more metaphorical way that the landscape was, was overseen by this flabby devil who was infecting Kurtz. And then because the piece starts at the crossroads, it starts at Times Square, so when I say, well, you know, this flabby devil will teach us all how to play the blues, that goes back to that, what Griel Marcus calls the old weird America of the blues players. And of course, very famously, Robert Johnson went to the crossroads to learn from the devil how to play the blues. So I begin with the crossroads of the world and end with the crossroads of old weird America. So but, yeah, thank you for that. I got sort of a big picture politics question that I think you've talked or both talked around the subject, but maybe just get at it in a little bit different way. In the 80s, uh, you know, the, the sort of first iteration of the so-called culture wars, sort of the Jesse Helms era, involving all of them, with, I guess the uh, epitomized by Maple Floor mm -hmm. um, and the NEA battles over him, and but but you know a lot of other artists involved. At that time, it seemed that the the art world and art in general was it, it certainly a tight and conspicuous focal point of the so-called culture wars if it wasn't the epicenter of it. And now, of course, the culture wars have expanded to pretty much engulf the entire, the, the, a whole range of uh, social issues in the United States. Um, it's greatly expanded. It's not just about the art world. Um, and I, I'm wondering, Given in this expanded iteration, and rather extreme one of the culture wars, where do you see the art world? It's it, it, given that it's it's no longer the only, it's no longer one of few areas in, in which you know culture battles uh, occur because they occur almost almost everywhere. And so, where do you see it situated? In, since those days, has it insulated itself in any way, or is it still? You know, a major battleground. That's actually kind of a great question because it leads us back to the Dadaist uh, Tristan Sarza, 
who once said, and I don't know the exact quote, but he once said something along the lines of, you know, the politics of art, the politics of the art world are a pale shadow of real politics. And now that you bring it up, in the 80s, of course, there was the NEA battles yeah. and, and all that kind of thing. But now, you're right, it has moved on to other things. I really think that the culture wars would find the art world really small potatoes and not worth the effort when you could instead have Ron DeSantis going after Disney. Mm -hmm. Now, Disney, of course, is yeah. <laughs> more part of the culture than I think many of us want. Right, so, but they're also corporate and represent massive amounts of capital. So I think that's where the targets have moved to. Now, then again, when you see attacking school boards and that kind of thing, I'm sure that if some artist did something that someone somewhere deemed offensive, and it becomes a big enough talking point, we'll hear about sure. it. Sure, and that, but that, that's a good way of putting it. it, it, it it's useful as talking points right. for other bigger issues. It's demagoguery and has been, yeah. it has been forever. It's not people who are passionately hurt about, the, I shouldn't say it, some people are, but I think the people who are fighting these culture wars are total demagogues. Right. But also, I think that the um, culture wars uh, yes, they've moved into other areas. But in the art world, the culture wars come from the left, mm -hmm. not from the right. Right now, that's a good point. The right is sort of ignoring the art world, but the left is much more particular about the types of things that are acceptable and not. Remember the um, candor thing at the Whitney Biennial, the... Uh, board member who um, the weapons technology yes, right. who produced weapons technology and I just read an article that that uh, they call it soft um, soft weapons is much more prevalent now around the world you know than it was when that whole um, uh, controversy and what happened was one of the board members his company, he owned shares in a company that made these weapons, these soft weapon things like, you know, tear gas. And um, uh, yes, right. and many of the Tasers artists pulled yeah. out of the Whitney in, in Biennial in hopes that he would resign. Mm -hmm. And then you've got the Sackler, Sackler. the, the uh, opioid uh, family. And right. that came also from uh, the artist, Nan Golden, yeah. who herself had had a, a problem with opioids and felt very strongly that uh, you know the museums and so forth shouldn't take their they shouldn't be allowed to whitewash their money right. that they've gotten through this phenomenal so that trauma and tragedy that they've inflicted yeah yeah and then the other one the third one I was going to mention was the uh, protests of the Co Koch brothers mm -hmm. but they haven't taken such a strong, quite a strong grip have they? Well, I mean, they're they're all over New York, and it's like I say, I know these nonprofits are desperate for money, but at some point you have to say we can't take money from certain avenues. And speaking of the left, you know, there's so much. I I was speaking at NYU where I do crits, and I was speaking with someone who was doing crit with me, but also does it as an, at another school, and he said. In their painting department, they now have a kind of unspoken rule among the people doing the critiques to not hurt a student's feelings. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm thinking to myself, well, then it's no longer a critique. It's no longer uh, 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 a... Right. And, and that does not prepare anyone for the real world. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and never mind the art world. Mm -hmm. It doesn't prepare them if they go to get a, a, a day job to support their art. Right. And it's terrible for their art. And, um, I mean, we were just laughing. And, and I can't imagine something like that is tenable over the long term. Um, because you'll just bring in someone who won't even be able to process that kind of uh, instruction right. of how to act. Right. And they'll go in and do a real crit. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it's it's we definitely have to worry about 
uh, becoming red letter, you know, worrying about whether or not someone's using the proper language or things like that. I just think that's a, a losing game. Right, but it's interesting that it's coming from, you know, inside and we're turning against each other. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought, you know, I have more in common with every, all artists, regardless of their political, uh, you know, approach, than I, than I don't. It becomes a big deal. And so maybe the idea that you go easy on the students is because they want to avoid that sort of controversy. It seems to me that the <coughs> behind the scenes thing is that these programs under and graduate are so expensive that the power has mm -hmm. turned into this, the students have the power. It's either they or their parents. Mm -hmm. Somebody's paying. And the university is kind of right. a little bit right. skinny. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. right. yeah, I mean, they, what if the parents come if you're an undergraduate and and you know, complain and where's your eighty thousand or one hundred and twenty thousand dollars going to go? So right. in some way, I don't. I don't think it's as much. I mean, to, there is a, certainly a whole political, politically correct speech thing going on, but there's also kind of a capitalist, you, you know, what's happening in universities mm -hmm. transactional that is right. different from back in our day when these right. tuitions were. So it's a messy knot. It's a messy knot. I'll, I'll, I'll counter that, though. This happens in a public school as well as... Right, it's spread, but I, I know. Right? And so um, that balance, sometimes you just have to ask a student, teaching many years, um, what, would, what did they want to accomplish? And then you can do a, a constructive criticism around what they wanted to accomplish. And did they accomplish it or not? Why they feel one painting, and this is about drawing out a, uh, a student to talk about their own work, not allowing other students to bash them. You don't know what social uh, and is going on socially with a group of students, but asking them and trying to draw them out to talk yeah. about the work. Um, about the, uh, yes, graduate schools are very expensive now, uh, but Hunter has the same issues, and they're only five thousand dollars a year. Uh, as as Parsons, as Columbia, as Yale, um, same issues are going on. I think we're out of time here, so you know we can continue with talking yeah. and yeah. chatting. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank for you, coming. everybody. That was great. That was great, Sarah. And thank, thank you, Jennifer Bang, for hosting Thank you, Jennifer. Spotlight. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. <laughs> yes. Oh, that was great. That was great. That was great. Thank you very that was much. Great.